All right, everybody, welcome to the f- episode one of Idea Orgy, and we're here with our guest, uh, Ryan Dougherty, Dougherty, right? <laughs> who's quit his job, living in Thailand. He lived in Thailand for five months. He and I overlapped for five weeks. We were training Muay Thai together, and Ryan, why don't you give people some background of your inf- your story? Hey Steve, hey everybody, good to be here in sunny Atlanta, Georgia. It's not as good as Thailand, but I'm glad to be here with my bro, Steve. Glad you're alive, man. Yeah, glad to be alive. So, in a nutshell, I know I've told you several times my whole story, but if I was going to wrap it up succinctly in one or two sentences, I was working in Chicago, Illinois, at a really good job pretty much making gangbusters, good money, pretty solid benefits, um, good work environment, but it all came down to the values around me and what people were spending their money and spending their time on. I just started to question all of it and I wondered who I was going to be in 10 years, 20 years, and the trajectory just didn't seem right to me and it, uh, It's kind of hard to go against the flow sometimes, but I made a pretty crazy decision to just quit that life, go see what's out there in the world, use my savings for, you know, I had saved up there for quite a while. I could live probably a good one, two, maybe more years just finding myself out there. Um, I don't want to go on and on, so I'll let you kind of interject with questions or whatever you want me to if you want to steer me in a direction, but the overall, the point of that is, I think it's important for each of us as individuals to every, every now and then question what we're doing, you know, ask yourself what is actually important to me. And if you don't know, it's important to try and go out there and find it. Nice. So there's two movies that I suggested Ryan should see. Rounders with Matt Damon, the poker movie, and Sleepers with Brad Pitt and Robert De Niro. I think those are two are really good movies that he should see. What's crazy is I've seen so many movies, and I'm a movie buff, but there's always going to be ones that fall through the cracks. Yeah. You can't possibly see everything that's ever existed. Exactly. But yeah, they sound really good. What's What's the premise of Rounders again? Um... He loses, he's trying to get, so Matt Damon's character is trying to get into the big leagues, like go to Vegas for poker, um, um, but then he loses to like this KGB, the guy's name is KGB, but he's like Russian mafia, and he loses to him, and he loses all his money, and then he has to like live the normal life. But rounders is a term for people who make their rounds around poker at night to different, like, to the different tables and the different venues. And then it just shows his comeback story. And it's very, very, it's a very good story. Yeah, I was going to say, I can't picture Matt Damon losing. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, Matt Damon, was he born... Yeah, Jason Bourne. He was also Jason Bourne. Yeah, I just totally didn't just recognize He's in The Great Wall. <laughs> the Great Wall. He's like the only white guy in China defending the Great Wall with like a bow and arrow against lizard monsters of lore. Is that in a recent movie? Yeah, it was like past five years probably. Oh. It got a lot of attention because of the whole whitewashing, you know. The white savior trope. Movement. Yeah, and people were kind of upset that he was cast in an otherwise pretty much exclusively Chinese movie. He had a couple of co-stars with him that were like his traveling troupe of mercenaries or whatever. The story makes sense, like, but I also see why people are upset to put like a famous white guy, he's kind of just like inserted into an otherwise Chinese movie. But on the flip side of that, I heard a lot of the time people, uh, we're kind of neglecting to see that Chin- the Chinese studio and Chinese audience wanted Matt Damon in the movie. So, I don't know. There's always 
two sides to a sword. I'm not sure if he wielded a sword in that movie. <laughs> no. I hope he did. I yeah. saw it. It's it's a good like watch if you you, you want to turn your brain off for a minute. <laughs> yeah. Um. He's been in a lot of movies though. Who Matt Damon? Yeah, yeah. I'm sure you've seen tons of them. Yeah. I I particularly just love I my probably favorite series and the series usually suck because the sequels suck but the series that are actually consistently good are the Jason Bourne series and we studied that in film class or my brother's film class that I would just like sit in sit in on and it like revolutionized the Jason Bourne series uh, movies revolutionized how films are action films are like cut and directed. Yeah, that changed everything. Yeah, like dramatic behind, behind the you know over the shoulder. Yeah, over exactly. You know about that. Yeah, yeah. Like jumping through windows, it, it puts you, it inserts you into the action. Scene. Yeah, it's yeah, intense. yeah. And then they were saying how um, the average scene cut, or average, yeah, average cut or average clip was about two two and a half seconds, as opposed to like. 30 years back it was like 10 and a half seconds or something and i i particularly think that it's because of technology and people's add so you have to like to keep them or attention you have to like keep people interested yeah yeah because of something, new cause of something yeah seconds. exactly exactly so that's that's what i was thinking but I don't, I don't know. You can't just you can't get away with just showing a shot of Clint Eastwood's face for 20 seconds <laughs> People people get bored. Oh, t- two movies that I saw, um, or two movies I, oh, two of favorite. Talk about your two favorite westerns. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. When we're on the Clint Eastwood subject, uh, I think back when I was in high school. So this is around like 2008, 2004 to 2008, somewhere in that period. I discovered the movie Unforgiven which is a phenomenal Clint Eastwood movie. I believe he directed it. He also starred in it. Uh, and I remembered, uh, I think it was just on TV one day. That was back when you know I lived in my parents' household, just a young pup. And uh, we they had TV, like actual TV, not Netflix and Amazon and all that stuff we've got today. Uh, because like you, I'm sure you don't have TV anymore, like yeah. real TV. So that was, anyways, that was another era. It was back in the day when you could just be in a room with a TV on and a movie would come on. You have no idea what you're watching. It just came on as like roulette. And sometimes you luck out, you discover something. Uh, but anyways, I think you watched it recently too, right? I did. I did. I watched it on your recommendation. And I watched it on when we were in Thailand. And it's a good movie. Yeah, it is. It's uh so Clint, the basic story, without spoiling too much, is it's as Clint Eastwood described it. It's his. It's everything that he believes a western is at heart, and he. I believe he. It's his story. He wrote and directed it. He plays sort of a, a reformed, notorious outlaw. Uh, named William Money, who back in his in his youth he was he was feared. He was well known throughout the West as a guy who was just a cutthroat, would kill you, got the job done, somebody to look out for. Uh, apparently, he was good at his job because he survived all those years. And when we pick up the story, he's an old man. He's uh he's at he's visiting his wife's grave who he credits having saved his life and by that he means rectified his ways showed him a better way to be you know yeah. with her love <clears throat> and so we pick up the story Clint Eastwood William Money is basically on his own trying to make ends meet to support his two young kids a boy and a girl without illegal means so he's farming he's doing whatever he has to do odd jobs it's obviously not easy for him but with a heavy heart he knows you know he'd be letting his wife down if he resorted to any of his old ways um cut to 
without going through all the details of the movie, he gets sucked back into his old ways because of this horrible, uh, I want to say he's, he's the sheriff of a town, or he's, he's the wannabe sheriff who kind of just took over the town, uh, played by Gene Hackman. He, uh, is a guy who, uh, for lack of a better term, Gene Hackman's character is kind of a hard ass and takes no sympathy towards con men or anyone who's ever, or, uh, anyone who, who's ever engaged in, uh, criminal activity or outlaw activity, so... Somewhere along the line, he discovers who this guy is, Clint Eastwood. He might be going by, like, a, a, a pseudonym or something. I can't remember, but he finds out William Money, Clint Eastwood's character, and uh, basically, you know, I think he locks him up maybe for, for a hot second in jail, threatens him, tells him to get out of town, maybe threatens his kids as his way of life. It ends up where uh, he, Clint Eastwood, really, really needs money, so he teams up with Morgan Freeman, who's also in the movie. They do what they have to do to track down uh, some guys on the run who they uh, they have a bounty on their head, so it's a easy way to make money with his particular set of skills. <laughs> Man, that kind of makes me wish that Liam Neeson was in this movie too. Yeah. <laughs> But anyways, he, Clint Eastwood gradually gets dragged back into his old ways, and it's a really realistic western where you see, it's kind of a slow burn movie where you see, you see like the, you know, the inner workings of an outlaw's mind. He's not just like a, a one-bit character in a Hollywood movie who's just all bad. He's got motivations, he's got family, he's got emotions, he's got a heavy heart, and when it comes down to an actual gunfight, he's the seasoned person who's seen it, who's been through it, and he knows, he, he says at one point early in the movie, like we were talking about before, that real gunfights, real fights don't go like you would think they would, like they do in the stories or in the movies. They, they usually end up with people being sweaty, panicked, misfiring, dropping their guns, tripping. It's usually just a shit show. And we actually see that later, towards the end of the movie. Clint Eastwood reluctantly has to come to the defense of his friend, his longtime friend, Morgan Freeman, who is, without giving too much away, is victimized in some way by Gene Hackman's character, ruthless, ruthlessly. Uh, Clint Eastwood reluctantly has to come to his aid and we we see a, a an incredible scene, a gunfight play out like that where they're just in a saloon, people are falling over, panicking, it's just it's not what you think when you think of a heroic gunfight, you know, like a duel in the streets. It doesn't always play out that way. So there are there are a lot of uh really cool really cool down to earth moments in that movie. And one of my favorite quotes actually is by Clint Eastwood in that movie. He uh he's kinda got a young protege at one point who he's trying to teach him otherwise, but this young guy has in his head, because he heard all these outlaw stories, he thinks that's the way to be. That's like the coolest, that's the alpha dog, that's the way to be. But this kid has never killed anybody. He doesn't know like the emotional toll it takes on you. He doesn't understand what any of that means in real life. So Clint Eastwood says at one point to him, trying to convince him otherwise, it's a powerful thing killing a man. Take away everything he's got, everything he's ever going to have. Dang. It's one of my favorite movies. That's a powerful quote. I yeah. think you liked it too, right? I, I did like it. I did talk, like it. talk for too long. I went on uh, kind of a, a, you know... Kind of gu- I could gush about that movie for hours. No, yeah, yeah, no, it's fine, it's fine. Uh, the second, you had another second favorite Western, 310 to Yuma. Yeah, maybe this, Russell- this, this one I'll, I'll start off. Since I know you like this one a lot, too, I'll let you pitch in a lot, too. We'll just kind of go back and forth on this one. We'll just gush about it. This is, uh, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know if you know, I, I think this might actually be a remake 
of a much older movie. If if oh, it I is, I never that. saw it. Uh, I have that in my head for some reason though. But yeah, three ten to Yuma uh, came out, I believe, sometime around two thousand ten ish. Uh, so it's a it's a fairly new movie. Uh, Unforgiven, by the way, I believe came out in like nineteen ninety. So it's not terribly old either. It's kind of like a more both of them are more modern westerns in comparison because you know you got like it's you know you could go way back to like the good the bad and the ugly all the dirty hairy type movies things in the 60s like that spaghetti western sergio leone leone i don't know i don't know if i've ever said his name right well, let's go with leone <laughs> but anyway 310 to yuma stars christian bale russell crowe and it as well as Unforgiven is it's a more modern movie but it's set in the classic western setting that we all know so it's in that way it's a timepiece. it's when I say modern it's not like you know it's not like today set today in 2019 in the west um but anyway Russell Crowe is an outlaw um Christian Bale plays the role of a ex-military uh, I think he was like an ex he was a sniper or something a rifleman in the Civil War he uh, since leaving the army he's he owns a ranch he's married he has two kids one of his kids has a terrible cough they kind of hint that he uh, is in the early stages of tuberculosis so I uh, they set up the movie in such a way that Christian Bale is really down on his luck trying to make ends meet, trying to support his family, the whole reason they live where they do, kind of in the middle of nowhere in the west in kind of like mountainous desert region is the dry climate which the doctor said is good for his young son's current tuberculosis um, to keep it from getting worse because it's, you know, in that day uh, I don't know the exact time, uh, maybe like 1860s, 1870s, 1880s, whenever this is actually set. That's, I mean, that's if you think about it, more or less a death sentence, you know. Yeah. It's just how much time do you have left. Um, I'll, I'll let you talk about Russell Crowe a little bit, and I'll pitch in what I think about him. He's he's probably the best character in the movie when you start to analyze him. Yeah. His, his essentially his highest ideal is seeking beauty and he would take the time to like draw a bird or he even risks getting caught and does get caught because he's trying to draw a barmaid that he comes across with and you'll see at the end without spoiling it that he's trying to help uh, the should, should we spoil it? I almost want to like tell the whole story, man. It's, it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead. And, let's go ahead and spoil it. <laughs> so essentially, he Christian Bale's uh, is has the task of turning him in, and turning in Russell Crowe. Turning it, yeah, turning in Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe is like the, I think his name is Ben Wade. He's like this notorious outlaw. He's wanted everywhere. Ooh. And it's it's a huge reward, and you know Christian Bale could really use that money. Yeah. But Christian Bale's not the type of guy uh, to risk everything, and you know he's not the type of guy who's ever like hunted someone down or like been around notorious outlaws. So it's a real fish out of water experience. But he uh he's kind of like pushed into it. Right? I think in the beginning there were like. Somebody bullied him into that situation too, right? Yeah. I think uh, his property was like on, it was on like a uh, river course or something. So these guys who owned. Yeah, 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 they, yeah. They like ended up burning down his barn or something. And yeah, yeah. He has to track down all of his cattle. He, Christian Bale's in a bad situation. Yeah. But anyways, Russell Crowe is kind of like on the opposite end of the spectrum. He's this outlaw who is, he's not hurting for money. He's kind of just doing whatever he wants. He stops and draws birds when he thinks they're beautiful. Even in, yeah. like, when they're about to, like, rob a stagecoach, he's just over there drawing a bird. <laughs> <laughs> and there's something really beautiful about that, you know, taking the time to 
appreciate things, smell the roses. He, uh, he's a type of guy that's been around the block. He's experienced life. And he knows that there's more to it than, you know... You know, you, you see the juxtaposition between Russell Crowe's character and the rest, the rest of his, like, hired outlaw gang. They're all basically, like... I mean, they're grown men, but they they might as well be kids. They just, you know, they get excited about shooting off their guns and money. And that's it. Women, you know. Russell Crowe is a character you can you can see it. He's such a good actor. You can almost see it in his face without him saying anything in this role. That he, there's a wisdom there. He just knows that there's more to it than that. It's, yeah, well you know, said. Uh, uh, yeah, you were starting to hint at like the end sequence, which it's one of the most beautiful parts of the movie. What uh, so Russell Crowe is being delivered to contention, which is where he's Christian Bale is trying to get him on this train to you know. I I believe if I remember they were going to hang him or he was going to a trial or whatever he was gonna you know have a reckoning for all his sins. At, at the very least, whatever form it was, but Christian Bale is trying to get him to the train, and and the train is the train is called Three Ten to Yuma. It's the, it's the Three Ten to Yuma, yeah, which is why the movie's called out. It's kind of like a race to get there because uh, Russell Crowe's outlaw crew is there. I mean, they're as cutthroat as anybody, and they're they're racing to beat them there in order to kill anybody, lawman or otherwise, who's trying to put Ben Wade on that train. By the end of the day, Christian Bale is the only one of anybody. It starts out with like a six, seven, eight-man crew, lawmen. Everybody drops out. Some of them are killed, you know, along the way. It is the Wild West, after all. Things happen. Some of them, a lot of them towards the end, just walk away. They decide it's not worth it. Oh, yeah. That's right. I forgot about that. A guy, that. even the, the guy who played the role of the Pinkerton, a guy who just was a ton of money, who was in their crew of people trying to deliver Ben Wade to the train to see justice, he even offers Christian Bale at the end when he sees the odds stacked against them. He knows the outlaw crew is just going to kill them if they go forward and try to get to the train. He offers Christian Bale a large sum of money, maybe even, I don't remember, it might have been more than what the reward was. And you see in Christian Bale's character, because he has his eldest son there with him, not the one with tuberculosis, the older son, who, they've kind of had a strained relationship, because he doesn't understand his dad, and like, he thinks his dad is a pussy, basically. <laughs> yeah. you know, to, put it, to put it plainly, uh, but Christian Bale knows that if he doesn't do this, who is he, you know? He, what kind of message is he sending to his son if he just gives up, they just go back to their life? You know, there's, there's a lot... Of, Christian Bale's an excellent actor, too, in that way. that you can, Yeah, he you is. You can see in his, through his eyes, through his face. He doesn't have to say anything in that moment. You can see all that emotion, all that responsibility on his shoulders. You can see what's in his heart just looking at his face in that scene and he ends up going through with it trying he he delivers Ben Wade to that train and he's the only one that that stayed the course and I'll, I'll let you talk about uh, what you know Russell Crowe was doing in that scene it's a beautiful like run it's like a gunfight a running gunfight towards a train where people are shooting each other behind barrels and you know, barns and whatever, but they're running on their way to the train through this town. Yeah, so there's a point where uh, Russell Crowe's character, Ben Wade, he tells Christian Bale's character, he's like, "All right, that's that's the end of the that's the end of the mill. Um, I'm gonna get off here right now and join my outlaw, outlaw crew." But then, and then Christian Bale just reveals he's just like. Man, I forgot what he says. It was a beautiful monologue in which he's like, he he did stuff to lessen his uh, stature in his eldest son's eyes. He's like, you look your son in the eye and then try to like do do this or whatever. And then Ben Wade's like, okay, and he agrees to go with them. And then so they're, they're like running through and everyone's like shooting at them. But it's not like... What's hilarious about it is, you know, 
Ben Wade, Russell Crowe. He's not being like pushed. Right? Yeah, he's, he's not, not being pushed or dragged or anything. He's like running with. Christian yeah. He's like leading Christian Bale, <laughs> Christian Bale at some points. Yeah, like almost helping him. Yeah, you know? exactly. I think his hands are in cuffs, but he's like, you know, pushing things over and guiding him. Because he's the type of guy who is like an action hero in this, you know, this inner universe that we're a part of in this movie. He's been through gunfights like this. He knows how to survive. But uh, it's a beautiful moment because Russell Crowe sees the beauty in this guy, this dad who's down on his luck, who is the only one who wouldn't give up when everyone else did in the face of danger, in the face of death. So we have this incredible gunfight running through the streets where Russell Crowe, who, as this outlaw who, you know, doesn't want to be locked up, has no reason to be helping his captor get him to the train, but he helps him do it because he wants to see this guy, Christian Bale, succeed and he does uh and i think we were talking about this pretty recently one of my, one of my favorite moments is when he gets ben wade to the train he uh i forget what he says exactly but ben wade you know looks christian he russell crowe looks christian bale in the eyes and says you did it you made it you got me here but uh you know realism takes a hold immediately after that which is I think what's so powerful about this movie is it is a really realistic down to earth movie everything that happened that we were just talking about is like something that could happen yeah it's just two guys running through the street (laughs) yeah but it's it's the meaning behind it and uh so spoilers if you don't want to hear this part you know just walk away for 30 seconds or so Christian Bale ends up getting shot in the back by, uh, I forget his name, Billy the Prince. Or he has a nickname. Yeah, uh, he's Russell Crowe's number two. Yeah, yeah, who's a notoriously, notoriously excellent marksman, uh, just like Ben Wade. So he shoots Christian Bale in the back. It's clear that, you know, it's been it's a fatal wound. I think he gets shot a few times. Yeah. You see you see the magic go out of Russell Crowe's eyes. He's he's on the train, and so his second-in-command shoots Christian Bale to get him off the train. Because he has no idea. He's just, you know, in comparison to Russell Crowe's character, he's just, a, like I said earlier, a kid with a gun who likes simple things. And uh, he thinks he's just trying to save his boss. He doesn't, he doesn't see the beauty in the world and the little things the way that Russell Crowe's character does. So you see the magic go out of Russell Crowe's eyes and how this guy, his second in command and his outlaw crew just robbed him of that beautiful moment. So probably, I don't know, 20, 30 seconds, maybe even a minute. It's a long, they really let it sink in. It's a long moment. Uh, Russell Crowe steps off the train, walks up slowly to you know, his second in command guy, gives him his gun back, uh, and then Russell Crowe, it doesn't make any sense to his second in command. He doesn't get it even to his death. Russell Crowe walks up right next to him, right up to him, point blank, shoots him in the gut, I think several times with his own gun. Says nothing to him. But he sends the message, just looks him straight in the eye, telling him, you just ruined a beautiful moment, you idiot. You don't understand. He, like, He's the type of guy who would never understand what was going on there. And it's that, that's the whole beauty of the movie. It's one of those ephemeral, you know, it's, it's life in a nutshell, whether you're in the West or wherever you are. It's those things that are fleeting that could be gone in a moment are the most beautiful things. I thought he kills them off all in the gunfight. He, like, Who kills... Oh, uh, Russell Crowe? Russell Crowe kills... I think, yeah, right after he kills that one, he kills the whole crew. Yeah, he kills the whole crew. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. they're all... Because they see that he, he killed the second in command, so they're like, oh, I'm, I'm indispensable as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, there's, like, and, a like a second or two where they they all kind of look at each other like, what the what the heck just happened? Are we, yeah. are we about to fight you? And yeah. he's the quickest... Russell Crowe's the quickest hand, so... They have that little Mexican standoff moment for, like half a second or whatever and then Russell Crowe just lightning speed just kills all of them there's yeah. like six of them <laughs> yeah there's something like that so that's an incredible moment too yeah but what it what it means speaks volumes yeah 
Uh, like I said, Russell Crowe's character's highest ideal is seeking beauty, and so he wouldn't compromise his character, even if it meant killing his second in command, who was like lo- so loyal to him. So, which was I don't I don't know how I feel about that exactly, but because <laughs> he, it's like it's like killing your dog almost. But just a loyal pet. Yeah. Much. Yeah, but then, um, but he wouldn't. So it just, I mean, it says a lot that he wouldn't compromise his highest ideal. For, but uh, yeah. Even in the ruthlessness of the West, there's something more to life. Yeah, Russell yeah. Russell Crowe saw that, and he just chases it wherever he goes. You know. For sure. Well. And uh I think to wrap up the movie too, he uh he uh makes sure that Christian Bale's family is alright after all that. He uh, I think he talks to the son and says something to the effect of everybody's gonna know that your dad got Ben away to that train when no one else would. Yeah. And uh the he makes sure that the Pinkerton, you know the guy with all the money who was just there for, you know, he had a vested interest financially. He made sure that that guy paid what was due to Christian Bale's family. So it's kind of a bittersweet ending, but we all like those, don't we? <laughs> you were saying how there's more to life, or <clears throat> Ben Wade always knew that there was some more to life, and you could kind of tie that into your own life, can't you? Yeah, well, I mean, I wasn't, like, a notorious outlaw or anything. <laughs> I was uh, working in corporate America in Chicago, but, yeah, kind of like a similar, you know, epiphany happened in my head that, you know, <clears throat> people people all around me were, you know, people were working career, you know, you know, working 30 years at this this place, and, you know... I started to wonder, like, what do they have to show for it? Like, none of, them, none of my coworkers were necessarily, like, unhappy. Everybody complained about the job, about work, about little things. Cause that, that's just human nature, I think. Nothing's ever perfect. But I started to think, like, is that what I want? Is that all there is? Just, you know, work here to get paid. Cause that's really the only reason that most people work, unless you love your job. I can tell you nobody loved their job at that place. I thought I loved it at first, but anyways, uh, I started to realize that it wasn't fulfilling work. It didn't really have a higher meaning to my life. I was just there for the paycheck, and as good of a paycheck as it was, what was the real value in doing that? Was it just to be able to buy a house, just to be able to buy a car, just to be able to buy a boat, just to be able to, you know what are all those things to me are those just checklists are those just like items on someone else's checklist that I just thought I needed to do that is kind of drilled into all of our heads at least subconsciously growing up in America that you know that's the responsible way to be when you get to that point you're financially all right and and, you know you're not not in a desperate state or anything and you've got the means you know, then you have kids and the whole cycle starts all over again. And there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of my friends are married, have kids, but I started to wonder, really, is that what I want? And the answer in my heart was no. Uh, there's a sort of a phrase that I kind of live by, comes back to me a lot, is to not ignore it's not it's not really uh it's a sort of paraphrase uh um, another movie we could go off on for probably hours there's a movie called whisper of the heart i haven't seen that which, uh, it's a miyazaki movie it's an animated movie oh movie. gotcha anyways uh we can go into that another time i'll make you watch that later too yeah it's beautiful but like the message that uh, I already knew this before seeing that movie, but uh, we've all had that moment where we read a book or we see a movie, and there's a message laid out for you, and you just realize you realize that you already knew that, but sometimes hearing it, you know, reaffirms what you already knew and spurs you to action. But I really recommend it, anyways. But uh, 
time and time again, I, I remind myself not to ignore the, quote, the whisper of the heart, which means when you have that little voice inside that's telling you what you want, don't ignore it, you know, listen to it, talk to it. The most important thing, most important dialogue I think that any of us have is with ourselves. And if you ignore that, you're going to end up being unhappy, you know? Even if you check all the boxes of, you know, what a, what a responsible, happy, successful person is, if you ignored that little voice in your heart, you're not going to be, you know, you're not going to be self-actualized. You're not going to be successful in your own heart. You're going to end up 30 years from now miserable, even if only on the inside. Um, hopefully that makes sense, you know? You yeah, know that's some wisdom right there. I think that's some very profound wisdom. Um, so uh, here I was in corporate America doing a really good job, you know, making good money, going home. It wasn't crazy hours. I could do what I wanted with my money outside of work. But every minute, every hour sitting at that job, eight hours a day, more sometimes, you know, when you have that voice in the back of your head constantly, you know, saying, what am I doing here? You know, the bulk of your waking hours are at a place you don't want to be. I mean, I think a little kid could tell you if you told him that story that you're in the wrong place. But we as adults tend to ignore what's inside in order to just go with the flow and maintain appearances and you know I was just done maintaining appearances so end of the year got my final paycheck got my bonus and I just told my boss hey I'm done and then I left went to Thailand and the rest is history yeah and are you are you happier now I am if if for nothing else I've had the freedom these past six months to be able to think for myself, to be able to just see the world with new eyes. And you know, I don't know where I'm headed eventually, none of us do, but enjoying your life day in and day out, I think is so important. You know, if you're not, if you're in a office chair making good money, but you hate your day every day, you're not gonna be happy in the long run. There, I mean, there is something to be said of being an adult, being responsible, sticking it out. But if you see an opportunity to get out of that situation and change your life, I'm all for it. Change your life, you know? That's some wisdom from Linky Jesus himself. Just so you know, Ryan Daugherty, he's like 6'5", Linky, and he looks like Jesus, which is why I call him Linky Jesus. <laughs> Thanks, man. Makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Um. All right, I think that I think that's good for now. Yeah, we can, we you can. should you you yeah. you you're you're very good at conversation. I when I'm like getting recorded, <laughs> I just like stumble over my own words. We'll handle it in post. Yeah, yeah, we'll handle it in post. But anyway, so that's the first episode of Idea Orgy. We didn't really have an orgy of ideas, but we talked about some higher level stuff like seeking beauty, uh, character development in movies and revelation and and finding your own this is a term that ryan told relate to me ikigai which is the reason for getting out of bed and uh, when he and i met at a bar or he took me to a bar and Char oh, when i visited him in charleston a couple uh, back in april i showed you the way he's like <laughs> yeah he was telling me about how his he's trying to find his ikigai so and now which, which really quickly is just something i read in a magazine on an airplane one time oh uh, yeah <laughs> so it's just something as little as that can wake you up it's something i already knew inside but then i had a word to attribute to it so yeah and yeah and this is idea orgy episode one thank you everyone for listening